Wah, 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 is all I heard. You know how adults talk in the Charlie Brown movies. Yes, my hearing went off five minutes ago. Now the sounds I heard began to be drowned out by a roar as the blood rushed to my ears in intense anger. I felt my knuckles turn white as I began to clench my fists on the table. Looking at my wife's face, I saw her lips moving as she tried to explain what she had just told me, but I was no longer listening to her. Fifteen minutes earlier, I just walked in the door after returning home from work on Friday night. I was looking forward to having a beer and winding down so I could start enjoying the weekend with my wife. Well, you know what they say about best laid plans. I actually got the beer. My wife put it on the kitchen table when I walked in the door. As for the rest of my plan, not so much. Then there were five words. Honey, we need to talk. Okay, before I get to the meat of this story, I should probably tell you a little about myself and my wife. My name is Robert Bader. I'm 28 years old and have a good job at an IT consulting firm. I have a master's degree in computer science. I'm 5'11", tall, weigh about 205 pounds, have brown hair and eyes, and I keep in shape with daily visits to the gym and a five-mile morning run. I was told that I have a beautiful face. My wife's name is Idella, but usually she is called Ida. She's two years younger than me, 5'5", five five, curvy but fit. She goes to the gym about three times a week. She has blonde hair just below her shoulders, blue eyes, toned legs, and an ass to die for, a small waist, and 34D breasts. Yes, the face is also very beautiful. We met at a party in college. At that time, her name was Idella Masters. She was finishing her bachelor's degree in accounting while I was already a year into my master's degree. We hit it off from the start and dated until the end of college. We got married about a year after graduating from high school. I should mention that sometimes she forgot to fully consider all the consequences of some of her decisions. This was especially true if there was something she truly believed in and wanted. Case in point, she had something of a feminist in her, so she didn't want to just blindly take my name when we got married. She insisted that she wanted to write one of those ridiculous hyphenated last names. You know, where it's her maiden name and then a hyphen before her husband's last name. Something like Scott Pruitt or Rodham Clinton. You get the idea. Whenever I tried to discuss this with her and tell her what an extremely bad idea it was, she would get defensive and accuse me of being misogynistic and trying to take away her identity. She remembered author woman who had done this and were very successful. She talked about several of her friends who did this without any problems. She ranted endlessly about how the patriarchy forces women to take their husbands' last names in order to subjugate women. I tried to explain that this is not the case here. I had no intention of trying to subdue her. Finally, I just sat her down, hyphenated her last name, and made her read it five times. Then, if she still wanted to use that name, I wouldn't mind anymore. Ida Masters Bader. The idea was suddenly dropped, and she changed her maiden name to my last name. I told you she's a natural blonde, didn't I? So we've been married for almost five years. We didn't have children yet, but we started working on it. We talked about getting her pregnant on our fifth anniversary, which was just over two months away. She has problems with the pill, so we always used condoms when we had sex. Our plan was that on the night of our fifth anniversary, we would go without condoms for the first time. This will be a special night for us. So this takes us back to the beginning of this sad story. With a beer in my hand, sitting across the table from my wife, I heard five terrible words and my rage grew. I just want to try something a little different for a month or so before we have kids. I need to get rid of all this before I settle down and become a mother. Ida tried to explain. So let's see if I understood everything correctly. Do you want to date other guys while married to me? Do you want to party and sleep with other guys, completely breaking your vows to leave everyone else? And you want me to be okay with that? Are you crazy? I almost shouted the last phrase. Look, it's only for a month or so. I need to sow the last of the oats before we can have our special fifth anniversary party as planned. Once this little outbreak is over... I can settle down and be a loving, faithful wife for the rest of my life. Not just no, but hell no. Robert, I have already made my decision. This is what I need to do. 
I'm not asking for your permission. I'm just letting you know in advance so I don't cheat on you. Seriously? How can I have sex with other guys without cheating on me? It's not treason if you know about it, and it's open. It's only cheating if I try to hide it and run behind your back. This is not the case here. That's why I'm telling you this in advance, before it happens. Besides, it won't be every night. It will probably only be Friday or Saturday night, and I'll be heading home in the morning. We'll still make love a few nights a week, and I'll make sure to clean up before I get home from our dates. You'll never have to worry about sloppy seconds. Oh, I'm sure I'll never have to worry about sloppy seconds because I won't touch you after you go on one of your first dates. Where did all this nonsense you spew come from? What in the name of all that is wholly planted this idiotic idea in your heed? I was pretty sure I knew where it came from, but I thought I'd ask anyway. Well, I talked to Susie about our plan to start a family. Susie! Certainly. You mean your four-time divorced colleague, Susie? The same Susie who cheated on all four of her ex-husbands? Do you seriously take marriage advice from her? Well, she said I really needed to get everything out of my head before we started a family. That way, I could really relax and be a great mom and faithful wife without regretting anything I may have missed out on. She also suggested that this experience with other guys would help in our own lovemaking by teaching me some new ways to please you. This can open the door to an even better sex life. She was delighted. Well, it was pretty obvious that she was going to go through with it no matter what I said. I tried several more arguments but was shot down each time. Okay, it's time to bring out the big guns. It's obvious that you're going to go through with this regardless of my wishes. So when are you planning your first date? I don't actually have a date yet, but Susie and I are planning to go to a club tomorrow night. Okay, but I warn you that if you try to bring anyone here, it will end very badly. Oh, I would never disrespect you like that. No, we'll either go to his house, his hotel room, or maybe go back to Susie's. Fine. I am in no way giving such permission, and I will not agree to any of it. But it is clear that my opinion has nothing to do with your decision. In that case, I won't touch you while this is happening. Also, keep in mind that this could have drastic consequences for our relationship. There may not be a place for you here when you decide to return. What do you mean, when I decide to return? I told you I'm not going anywhere. It's only one or two nights a week. The rest of the time we will be together. No. I won't allow this. If you're adamant about it, you'll leave to do it. I don't care where you go, but you won't live here while you're dating and fornicating with other guys. Do not be silly. This is my home too. You can't just kick me out. Can. Don't you remember that this house actually belongs to my parents? They gave it to me just before we got married. This is my home. Maybe you should move in with Susie. It was cold the rest of the night and the next day. She tried to get me to sleep in the other bedroom, but I insisted that the bed was as much mine as it was hers, and I was going to sleep there. If she doesn't want to sleep in the same bed with me, she can sleep somewhere else. We pretty much avoided each other the next day. Around 8 o'clock, Ida came downstairs in her LBD stockings and garter belt. No, I couldn't see the garter belt or the top of the stockings, but I recognized that look. And four-inch heels— her hair was styled, and she was wearing night on the town makeup and jewelry. The only thing she had in her hands was a small clutch. Have you forgotten anything? No. I have my phone, wallet, and ID. I think that's all I need. What about suitcases, clothes, cosmetics, toiletries, and so on? I'm only leaving for the night. Why do I need all this? I'll be back before morning. Not really. As soon as you walk out the door, I'll change the locks. I told you that you won't live here as long as you insist on this nonsense. Do not be silly. I know you love me enough to let me do this. Well, obviously you don't love me enough not to do that. If you walk out this door, you won't come back in again. Just as she was about to answer, a car horn sounded from the driveway. This is Susie. I have to go, but we'll talk when I get home. What she didn't know was that I had installed several hidden apps on her phone while she was getting ready in the bathroom. Now I could track her location, read her text messages, record her phone conversations. Hell, I could even activate her microphone and camera without her knowledge. In fact, 
I activated her microphone as soon as she left the house. He recorded her conversation with Susie while they were driving. I'll listen to it later. Right now I have to work. First order to replace door locks with new ones I purchased earlier in the day. Then he took her car out of the garage, reprogrammed the garage door opener, and removed the remote control. Third, I packed all her clothes, toiletries, and cosmetics in boxes that I bought in advance. Two hours later, I loaded all her things into the car. Now it's time to listen to her conversation with Susie. God, he's mad. Well, I warned you about this. He will be angry for a week or so, but it will pass. Just make sure you really blow his mind over the next few days. Once he sees how much better the sex is, he will begin to accept the situation. Guys are like dogs. You can get away with anything if you reward them properly. Correct use of women's tricks will correct their attitude towards what you want. Yeah, I just hope this guy you're setting me up with doesn't leave me too upset to have the energy to have good sex with Rob tomorrow night. Just make sure you take a good soak in the bath tomorrow. This should relieve any pain. Now take off your panties and leave them in the car. You won't need them today. To take them off, you first had to put them on. Oh, you little slut. They both laughed. I guess I should describe Susie. She is a 5'4 sexy dynamo. She's got long, fiery red hair all the way down to her ass, emerald green eyes, an angelic face, 38 DD breasts an ass sculpted by about a million thrusts, a tiny waist, and the morals of a street cat drawn to ecstasy. All four of her marriages ended in divorce due to her infidelity. This was impressive because she was only 26 years old. Seriously, who gets divorced four times before turning 30? No, I never clicked on it. But it wasn't for lack of opportunity. She made it more than clear that I would be welcome in her bed any time I wanted. I should also mention that this wasn't the first time she tried to talk Ida into doing something phenomenally stupid. Usually these tended to be attempts to involve us in some sort of threesome or more with her. So far, I have managed to avoid this. I listened a little more until they arrived at the club. Trying to listen to anything in a club was a hopeless endeavor. There was simply too much noise to hear any conversations. Instead, I started doing online banking by monitoring her GPS location. I withdrew half the money from the checking account, paid off and canceled our joint credit cards, transferred all of our savings to an offshore account. I opened a couple of years ago and transferred about 70% of our investments to a separate account in my name only. I noticed that the GPS on Ida's phone was moving, so I opened the microphone on it again. Of course, Ida spoke and I heard an unfamiliar male voice talking to her. Oh, my phone is ringing. Rustling. Hi, Susie. How are you? Hello, girl. Did you leave with that guy you danced with? Yes. We're going back to your house for some alone time. I hope you don't mind us using the spare bedroom for an hour or so. No problem, baby. I'll probably be there soon with his friend. Let's have some fun. I hope. I'll need to take a shower after we're done so I can go home later. I thought so. I put some shampoo and body wash in the spare bathroom for you. Thank you. See you later. By this time, I turned on her camera to see if I could get a look at the guy she was with. I only caught a glimpse of it as she put the phone back in its place. It didn't make much of an impression on me. All I could tell was that he looked like he was about 30 years old, black hair that's thinning, and judging by his height when he sat, he was a little shorter than me. I turned everything off since they were still driving. When I saw that they had arrived at Susie's house, I turned the microphone and camera back on. I continued to listen until I heard them begin to move away from the phone. It just won't do. I needed her phone to be in the same room so I could get audio evidence of her deception. The video is unlikely to work. Crap. What's happened? This is my husband's call. And what? Don't pay any attention to it. I cannot. I'll talk briefly and get rid of him. Hi, darling. How are you? Where are you, Ida? I'm at Susie's. We'll just relax a little and then she'll take me home. I'll be back in a couple of hours. We just put on a film. Fine. I just wanted to make sure you didn't end up in a bad situation. I'm fine. Stop worrying. See you in a couple of hours. Fine. Goodbye. She must have had too much to drink because she didn't even notice that I didn't use any kind words or tell her I loved her when I hung up. She also didn't understand that I said goodbye at the end.
By some miracle, she took the phone with her into the bedroom. I think it was because she was walking there when she was talking to me. Better yet, she placed it on the nightstand, leaning it against the lamp. The camera had a pretty good view of most of the bed. I'm pretty sure I'll never be able to use this in court. But at the time, I didn't really care. I watched enough of the video to be sure they were actually having sex, then minimized the window and continued recording. Well, if she decided to go out and have sex with other guys, I saw no reason to just sit at home and get blue balls, waiting for her to come back. You know the old saying, goose, goose, and all that crap. Fuck her shit. I'm gonna go to have fun. In a similar way. Moreover, I'm going to rub it in her face. She, naturally, did not return home. She had to stay with Susie. I spent the rest of the weekend doing projects around the house and working on an old truck. I have a 1972 GMC pickup that I bought on the cheap a few years ago. I've been working on this for a while now. I installed a built 350 engine, replaced the old three-speed manual transmission with a Borg Warner Super T10 four-speed manual transmission, a 12-bolt rear differential, leather bucket seats, and matte black paint. All that was left was to finish installing the steel braided lines to connect the engine to the fuel, radiator, and vacuum fittings. Work kept me distracted throughout the week. Plus, since I stopped communicating with Ida, I was able to finish the truck and get it ready for the road. I also visited a lawyer and began preparing divorce papers. There was really no way not to give her half of everything. The divorce laws in this state must have been written by hardcore feminists. Let's face it, if you're a man, you're screwed in your divorce. Women cheat. The poor innocent husband who was faithful and did nothing wrong ends up paying the adulteress to continue her philandering lifestyle. There's not much a guy can do to protect himself. So, Friday evening came. My truck was cleaned and ready for the evening. After taking a shower, shaving, putting on a little cologne, I got dressed. I put on nice new Levi's jeans, a black button-down shirt, and rattlesnake leather cowboy boots. It was time to treat myself, so I went to a nice steakhouse for dinner to start my evening. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but the T-bone, baked potato, and vegetables were excellent, as was the salad to start. Now let's move on to the main event. Leaving the restaurant, I checked where Ida was. Indeed, it looks like he and Susie got to the club about half an hour ago. It's time to put my plan into action. I had every reason to expect that this would completely drive Ida crazy. I couldn't help but smile as I parked a couple spaces away from Ida's car. Looks like she was the designated driver today. This made my plan a little easier since I wouldn't have to worry about Susie leaving her stranded. Not that I was worried about anything myself. I was mainly concerned that it would be a little harder to get Susie to leave with me if she was driving. Having made a plan, as well as a plan B in case Susie somehow developed moral problems, I entered the club. They weren't hard to spot. Susie, I didn't know you'd be here, I said, approaching their table with a glass in my hand. I deliberately waited until Ida got up so I could dance with some guy. Rob, what are you doing here? She asked nervously. Probably the same as you, I answered. Since Ida moved in, I thought I'd try this club and have some fun tonight. Speaking of which, would you like to dance? Um, I should probably let you know that Ada is here with me. And how does that stop you from dancing with me? Also, since she's not here, I can only assume she's either in the bathroom or on the dance floor by herself. Come on, you've never shied away from dancing with me before. Her worried look turned it into a grin. Certainly, I'll be happy to dance with you. We were there for three fast songs before the slow number came on. I didn't give her a chance to leave. As soon as the music started, I pulled her in and held her close to me. About a song and a half passed before Ida noticed me. I almost fell to the floor laughing when her surprise turned to fear that I had caught her. She left the dance floor immediately after the song ended and returned to their table. Now I saw her looking at me with poorly concealed anger. Oh, you poor bitch. I haven't even started to make you angry yet, I thought to myself. Susie held me tightly as we slowly danced together. As I said earlier, Susie is the bombshell. 
so it didn't take me long to stand to attention and salute, if you know what I mean. It didn't take her long to figure it out either. She looked at me with a wide smile and pressed at herself even closer. As I turned to face Ida, I slowly lowered my hand to Susie's ass. When the song ended, I walked Susie back to their table. She invited me to join them, and of course I agreed. On our way back, we stopped and asked the waitress to refresh our drinks. Being the gentleman that I am, I asked her to put all three drinks on my tab. Robert, what the hell are you doing here? Ida hissed angrily. What do you mean? I'm doing the same thing as you. I drink, dance, and have fun. Is this prohibited? Don't try to act innocent. You're here to ruin my evening. She spat. Quite the opposite, Ida. I had no idea you'd be here. Do you remember? We haven't spoken since you moved. How do I know where you will be? I heard about this club from some buddies at work, and since you weren't around, I decided to check this place out and have a fun night of drinking and dancing. Are you saying that this is normal for you, but not for me? Because I have to say, that's pretty hypocritical of you. With that, I turned to Susie and started chatting with her. Ida sat and seethed with anger while I tried my best not to pay attention to her. She must have decided to make me jealous because she tried her best to dance with as many guys as possible. She also started polishing them and dancing as flirtatiously as possible. I laughed to myself as I monopolized my time with Susie. Every time I saw another guy make a move to come and ask her to dance, I would pull her onto the dance floor before they even got to the table. Pretty soon no one tried anymore because it was obvious that we were together. After a couple of hours, I decided it was time. Ida was on the dance floor, and Susie was well-prepared and accommodating. At your home with me, I whispered, breathing into her ear. Ida will be there soon. Does it matter? I'm guessing she has her own room. I kiss the place where her neck meets her shoulder. To hell with it, she replied. She's driving. She'll get home herself. Let's go. I kept her tense as I drove her to her. Her dress was pulled over her head and fell to the floor as soon as the door closed. She grabbed my hand and practically dragged me into her bedroom. The sex was fantastic. Obviously, she had a lot of practice. I had just reached my peak and was discharged when I heard the front door slam. Susie was too busy to notice. Also, Susie is very loud when she has sex. Double bonus, Ida's room is next to Susie's only separated by a thin wall. Around two o'clock in the morning, we passed out from fatigue. In the morning, we had sex again. Breakfast was awkward, to say the least. Obviously, we woke up Ida with our morning fuss. When we left, she was already in the kitchen. Coffee? Ida asked when I entered the kitchen. Everything is fine. I will do it myself. I noticed a slight smirk on her face when she asked. I took a clean cup from the cupboard and stood next to Keurig, while he filled the cup. There is no telling what would have been in the coffee she made for me. After that, there was almost no conversation between us. She and Susie talked a little, and I talked with Susie. Apparently, at the club, Ida eventually noticed that the two of us were missing and put two and two together. I think she expected me to take Susie to my house and was furious when she saw my truck in the parking lot. She ranted so much that the guy she brought home for the night jumped back into his car and drove off. Ida looked at me like a wolf during breakfast. Soon after that, I left. I can be a real asshole when I'm motivated. I was really motivated. Ida has worked with some very attractive single women. I met them several times at her company events and parties we hosted. Of course, I had their contact information. I started contacting them. Over the next few weeks, I convinced most of them to go on a date with me. Some of them were a little worried because Ida and I were still married. But as Ida talked about her adventures at work, and I assured them that we had separated, they softened. I began to hear that there was tension between Ida and Susie because of my little escapade. Tensions also soon arose between Ida and most of the other single women in the office. So, yes, I started meeting Ida's friends and colleagues. I had drinks and dinner with them. I invited them to dance. I took them to shows. At every opportunity, I made sure to show up where Ida was. This GPS tracking app and the voice and video app on her phone became a gold mean. 
I also heard that most of her colleagues I dated raved about their dates with me. She still went out and brought guys with her. She and Susie began to clash more. I, I was having a great time. I went out, had dinner, danced, and had sex. I also had fun listening to Ida rant. This is not how it was supposed to work. What do you mean? said Susie. He was supposed to wait for me when I sowed my last wild oats and then greet me so we could start our family. He was not supposed to date or have sex with other women. Susie was also puzzled. Yes, I didn't expect it either. So what are you going to do? Well, now I had my fun and none of the other guys could rock me like Rob. Also, our anniversary is coming up and we have a plan to start working on having a baby on the night of our anniversary. Yes, he knows exactly how to send a girl into orbit. Susie knew what she was talking about. And why the hell did you bring him here and have my husband all night and the next morning? Hey, cool down. You know I've been lusting after him for years. What the hell was I supposed to do when he came at me like that? He turned it up to full speed and pressed all my buttons. I couldn't help it. But he's my husband. You could show your best friend some respect. Fine, I'm sorry. Look, he didn't even call me anymore. I doubt we'll ever meet again. Besides, it's not me you need to be mad at. He checked on all our single colleagues. God, I can't believe these fucking colleagues are setting me up like this. It's time to take back what's mine. So now you're going back to him? Yes. I'll call him later and tell him that I'm ready to come back and start our family. I smiled listening to this conversation. She had no idea what would happen next. It's time to begin the final part of the plan. I called my lawyer and gave her final instructions. There was just over a week left until our anniversary, and I needed to get ready for an unforgettable holiday. Ida called later that day. She wanted to go home right away, but I refused. I told her that I had other plans that I had made because I didn't know what her plans were. I also told her that I had some work to do around the house, and I wanted to surprise her when she got home. I didn't want her to see it until it was all done. This will be part of her wedding anniversary gift. I may have dropped a couple of hints that she may have mistaken for one of the bedrooms being converted into a nursery for the new baby. I never actually said that. In the end, I convinced her that she could come on our anniversary to receive her surprise. God, would she be surprised? All preparations had been made and everything was completed. It was Saturday evening, and the anniversary party I had planned was in full swing. I had a BBQ and pool party to celebrate. Ida didn't know that I had installed the pool in the last two months. This was just the beginning of the surprise. All our friends and family were there, as well as a couple other guests. It was around 6 p.m. when the doorbell rang, just in time. It was at this time that I told Ida to come. Apparently she saw a lot of cars in front of the house, so she already knew we were having a party. She was surprised as she carried her suitcases into the house. Everything is fine. The guest of honor has arrived, I announced. Rob, what's going on? I kind of thought we'd go out and have a quiet romantic dinner tonight, she said. Oh no, today is a big holiday, and I want all our families and friends to be here to celebrate with us. Oh, Okay, darling. It just surprises me a little. I didn't expect anything like this. Well, just put your suitcases here. We'll take care of them later. You'll be just in time for dinner. As the guest of Honor, you and I will be first in line. Ida quickly got into the swing of things and started having fun. There has been no talk of activity in the last two months. We ate, drank, and laughed. Dinner was finished and put away. There was a light on in the backyard. Ida was very surprised by the pool and several other changes to the house. I haven't shown her the top floor yet. She was hinting that she wanted to see what I had done because she still thought I had turned one of the bedrooms into a nursery. It's finally time to reveal the rest of the surprises. All! May I have your attention, please? I have some announcements for this special day, I shouted for everyone to calm down and listen. The stereo was turned off and everyone fell silent and moved closer to here. Fine. Thank you all for coming today. Now I have a couple of announcements to make. Ida, could you come here with me, please? After she stood next to me, I continued. Firstly, I want everyone to know that yesterday was my last day of work. 
The only person who knows about this is my former boss. He was very friendly about it because I gave him a month's notice and explained what my plans were. I am now announcing that I will be opening my own consulting company. This will allow me more freedom to spend time with my family. Ida practically beamed when I emphasized the last word. As you all know, today is Ida and its fifth anniversary. What most of you don't know is that we plan to start our family on this day. Having said that, I want to give Ida a special anniversary gift to commemorate our relationship. With these words, I quietly took a couple of steps to the side and nodded to the red-haired woman at the end of the group. She nodded in response and moved forward. Idella Bader, you've been served, said the woman. What most of you don't know, I continued. Two months ago, Ida told me that she was going to date and sleep with other men. She didn't ask if I agreed with this. She left me no choice. She just told me that she was going to do it and that there was nothing I could do about it. For the past two months, she had been living with her friend and taking different men to her home to have sex with them. This is something I simply will not put up with. To be fair, I also dated other women, but I started it after Ida had already broken her wedding vows. No, no! Ida screamed. For your actions, I'm giving you a divorce so you can go and have sex with whoever you want. Rest assured, it won't be me. So, I told Ida that I was doing some renovations on the house. That's exactly what I did. You all saw the pool, I added, and a few other things down below. I also repainted the master bedroom and installed a new, larger shower, as well as a jacuzzi tub in the master bath. I also ripped out the wall between the two smaller spare bedrooms to expand them into one large bedroom with its own bathroom. I did this for a very specific reason. As I was saying this, the same red-haired woman and a ten-year-old red-haired girl were walking towards me. I want you all to meet my lawyer, Tara O'Reilly, and her daughter, Simone. Tara is also a single mother. I met Tara two months ago, on the Monday after Ida went to the club and brought her first guy. Since then, we have become very close. Although we haven't officially started dating yet, we both feel like there's something between us. Simone and I get along very well, too. Once the divorce is final and she is no longer my lawyer, we plan to be together. Her rent is up soon and Tara and Simone are moving in with me. I turned back to Ida. So, Ida, as for what to do with your suitcases, you can take them back to your car. You won't come back here. I told you I wouldn't stand for this, but you just rushed ahead and ruined our marriage. Ida was sobbing uncontrollably. Her family screamed and screamed. Most of the friends quickly left. My family sat stunned. Tara and Simone quietly went upstairs and disappeared from view. They were prepared for this reaction and agreed when I asked them if they would be okay with it. To be honest, Tara and I didn't even kiss. True, we went out to dinner and I spent a few evenings with her and Simone at their apartment, but we agreed to put everything else on hold until my divorce was final. She divorced her husband five years ago because she caught him cheating. She left the house several times after that but never felt the spark. In the end, everyone finally left. I don't know where Ida went. That same day, I deleted all the spy apps I had on it. I no longer cared what she was doing. Would it have been better to handle this differently? Maybe. Maybe I shouldn't have brought Tara and especially Simone into this. Again, probably. Why did I do this? The simple answer is anger. I was angry at what Idea did. I also wanted to make sure everyone knew that Ida ruined our marriage with her selfishness. I wanted to publicly make Ida feel the pain she had caused me. She killed my love for her and made me hate her. I wanted her to feel the loss of love and the hatred it caused. Yeah, I could just serve her at work while she lived with Susie. I could just send everyone a packet with my evidence. I could have done a lot of things that would have been much more mature and much less painful for everyone. In the end, I did what I did. Ida returned to Susie. This went on for about two weeks before they were at each other's throats. Eventually, she got her own small apartment. I often see her in the city. Her facial expression when she sees me alternates between sadness and anger. I think it depends on her mood. We don't exchange pleasantries. 
I actually heard from one of her colleagues that she left the company and found a new job. The stress of me dating so many other women she had to work with became too much for her. I also see her family sometimes when Tara Simone and I are having dinner. Again, we don't talk, but they frown at us. We just ignore it. Speaking of Tara and Simone, Ida tried to fight the divorce, but soon realized that it was a hopeless matter. Wanting everything to end quickly, Tara allowed me to increase the pressure on Ida by continuing to meet Ida's colleagues. Ida signed the papers after she heard a glowing report about our night together with her colleague on the morning of my fourth date at work. The day the documents officially dissolving my marriage arrived, Tara and Simone moved in with me. A year later, Tara and I got married. Another year later, we met Ida, while Tara, Simone, and I were wandering around a street fair. Ida turned and ran away, sobbing when she saw Tara's six-month pregnant belly. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Second story. By a twist of fate, I met my wife, Linda. Also, by a quirk of fate, I found out that she was cheating on me. Although the events were separated by years, the two events occurred in the same place. This place was located at my workplace in Honolulu, Hawaii. The business I started came about by accident. I went to the University of Hawaii with every intention of getting an MBA and then getting a job at a Fortune 500 company. Even with public tuition, I still had to work to get through school. In high school, I became interested in computers. So to make extra money in college, I used my acquired skills in computer repair. Eventually, I started building my own and selling them at a lower price than Best Buy. I received my bachelor's degree but decided not to go to graduate school. I started my own business, so why would I work for someone else? In college, I realized that I was bad at interacting with people. This lesson was as valuable as my degree. I met Linda's brother Don before I even met her. He had problems with his computer, or rather with his father. He brought his father's old Intellivision game console. It was a little-known piece of gaming equipment that dates back to the 1980s. Don's father was nostalgic for it, and Don wanted it restored for his father's birthday. This thing hasn't worked in over ten years, but Don found it in the attic. Don Eldridge was built like a brick. His chest was close to a rectangle. He played football as a defensive back in high school and college. Back then, he let his curly brown hair grow long and wild, and he had a beard to match. Add to this a very large nose that could be called a trunk, coupled with the fact that his name was Don. And inevitably, someone called him Mastodon. The name stuck. Every time he made a feint, the fans made elephant noises. Although he looked impressive in appearance, his demeanor could not have been more friendly. Don was always the guy who would reach out to pick up a player he had just dropped. He had a sense of fair play, as well as some fearsome skills on the football field. If he hadn't injured his knee during his senior year at the University of Hawaii, he might have made it to the NFL. Mastodon belonged to the Hawaiian royal family. Even though I'm not athletic in the slightest, I've always followed the Rainbow Warriors. Yes, this is a real team name, adopted by our common alma mater long before rainbows became fashionable. Although I decided that continuing to college was not for me, I had some loyalty to the place where I spent four years studying something I didn't want to do next. I was a little amazed. Mastodon, I can't believe Hawaii's most eligible bachelor came to see me. By the way, my name is Ryan, Ryan Novak. He gave me a friendly slap on the back, nearly dislocating my shoulder. Well, Ryan, I won't be single for long. For some reason, the woman accepted my offer to marry my ugly ass. My sister is the most attractive in the family. That didn't set the bar too high. I told him my price, which was discounted because of my gratitude to this man. I asked for his autographed photo. My marketing studies were not in vain. Two weeks later, I actually met Linda when she came to pick up Don's restored computer because he was doing local advertising or taking tourists on his boat for Mastodon tours. I was blown away. She had the same curls in her long brown hair as her brother. Her nose was not as prominent and she was several inches shorter. Essentially, she had many of the same features in a much more attractive and petite package 
that also included breasts and dimples. She wasn't stunning, but she was definitely attractive and had a distinct sexuality. We started dating and that's how I met her best friend, Don's wife, Candace. Candace and Linda have grown up together since elementary school. Candace has been in love with Don since she hit puberty. Eventually, Candace turned into a woman and Don noticed his sister's friend and began courting her, or something like that. This is the saccharine version, I'm told. Candace has turned into a beauty. She's one of those Hawaiian women you see in travel ads, a mixture of Asian and Native Islander with God knows what other bit of cuteness mixed in. There was no doubt in my mind that she was targeting him, and he was powerless to resist. All three of them shared memories that I was not a part of. But in the end, I got settled. The only thing that was noticeable was that Candace was never called by the obvious nickname, Candy. She stopped anyone from using the nickname, and one night, when I asked her why, she replied, Candy sounds like a stripper who's empty-headed. I never wanted anyone to think of me like that. Don and Candace got married, and soon Linda and I did too. Linda and I had two children. Don was shooting blanks, and he and Candace both wanted kids, so they adopted two. They adopted each child around the same time Linda gave birth to ours. Adoption does take time, and it was like we were all in sync with each other. It was great to be part of a strong quartet. We loved being around each other. All the kids played together, and we were in each other's lives almost daily. Naturally, something so perfect cannot last long. The gods hate eternal happiness in our lives. I grew my business so much that Linda didn't have to work. Not only did I repair and build computers but I also restored old arcade games and home gaming systems. The change came when our children were old enough to go to school. Linda wanted to work part-time. I didn't have any problems with it. Why not? I didn't want my beloved to be bored. She took a job with a credit card company in their call center. It was four hours a day, and she could always send the kids to school and be back before they got home. I was happy. She was happy. We all should have been on the poster of Model Families, it was Candace who accidentally revealed to me the fact that Linda was cheating on me. It was a typical work day for me when Candace called me and said, Ryan, I really need you to work on my computer. This is an emergency. I need this right now. The emergency was that her laptop was a piece of metal that wouldn't even start. Candace was an aspiring writer, and her stories were only on this laptop. I assured her that I would do my best after lecturing her about the need to back up her work to a flash drive and then dug deeper. It wasn't that difficult to recover the data. Candace uploaded something she shouldn't have. Curiosity took over, and I began to look for the culprit. It turned out that it was a photo that Linda had sent by email. This letter contained a photograph of a very handsome, shirtless man. I later learned that his name was Hunter Sampson. Linda's text accompanying the photo read, This is my boss. The photo plus the exclamation point made me look into Candace and Linda's email. Without going into detail, Linda's boss sent her this photo and she shared it with her best friend. I will say this for my sister-in-law. She questioned Linda about what happened. What did she say that her boss thought it was okay to send her a photo of him showing off his amazing abs? She was merciless in this email exchange when Linda tried to put it aside, saying it was just a photo of him surfing. This angered Candace and she said in no uncertain terms that Linda was very close to crossing the line. Linda backed down and agreed. She said she wouldn't encourage anything like that again. Everything looked good. Still, I was suspicious. Did it really end after Candace told her off? I wasn't sure, so I looked at Linda's laptop. Knowing that she knew what I did for a living, I knew she would be smart enough to delete any damn emails and also smart enough to empty the trash can if she sent something she shouldn't. Be noticed. What she didn't delete were her sent messages. This confuses so many people. This folder was a revelation. Many of her messages were in response to a previous message, so I quickly got a pretty good picture. Linda sent him a photo of her breasts. She didn't send a single photo of her private parts, even though Hunter asked. She told him she would send one when he sent a photo of his manhood. He simply told her that she had to see him in person because no photograph could do it justice. After that, subsequent letters became even worse. Yes, after that, they had sex. 
They both raved about how good it was every time they met and couldn't wait for the next time they met. I did what any normal person would do, went through my wife's personal email, and discovered what I discovered. That evening I decided to meet her face to face. This had to be handled delicately as it was Wednesday, and the kids had school the next day. I didn't want the neighbors to call the police. Children tend to remember such moments. So when I got home that evening, I answered her when she said, Hey, honey, how was your day? Let's talk about this later. It seemed to her that I was alarmed about something. I must have had a terrible face. She didn't put any pressure on me. We had dinner and put the kids to bed. We walked over to the couch, and she looked at me and said, Whatever is on your mind, I hope you know you can talk to me about it. I'm so glad I can. It can be difficult for a man to openly express his feelings. You really made me feel comfortable so I can express everything right now. I put my hand on top of hers. Linda seemed touched. Of course you can, dear. I am your protection. She squeezed my hand and I squeezed it back, looking her straight in the eyes and saying, It really bothers me that you're sleeping with your boss, so I'd really like to talk about how we handle divorce without it hurting the kids. She pulled her hand away from mine as if it were radioactive. Then her face turned white and she made a sound like a dying animal, jumped out the door, got into the car, and drove away. Things didn't go quite as I expected. I had prepared a whole speech and her departure prevented it. This was an offense worse than deception. I mean, I actually rehearsed so many choice comments in my head. It only got worse. Now I had to prepare the children for morning school, and this was not my thing at all. I had no chance to vent or get an explanation, and suddenly, I was a single father with two children. For the next two days, Linda remained silent. I had no idea where she was or what she was thinking. She just disappeared. Explaining to the children where she went was a delaying tactic. Until I heard from her, I had no idea what to say without traumatizing them. So I told them what I thought they could understand without worrying. Mom visits Aunt Candace and Uncle Don. As it turned out, this was true. Linda lived with her best friend and brother. I learned about this over the phone from Don, who invited me to his home to talk to Linda without the children. I love Don and Candace. This was clearly an intervention. Curiosity made me agree, as well as the desire to finally give my speech. The intervention took place at Don and Candace's home. Don and Candace sat on the couch, a friendly couple. Linda and I sat in comfortable chairs facing the sofa. Looking back, I realize it was a good arrangement. It was as if Don and Candace weren't taking sides, rather we were both on trial. Don started the conversation by saying, Ryan, I love you. You were a wonderful husband to my sister, and I will always adore you for that. However, I know that my sister hurt you. It hurts me too, brother. I want you to know that. I feel bad for both of you. My nails grabbed the arms of the expensive chair I was sitting in as I said, I'm glad you feel my pain. I'm glad you can empathize. I really want Hunter to share my pain too. I mean, he really played a role in this. I wish he could feel pain all over his body because that's how I feel right now. I hope you're not thinking about physical violence, Candace intervened. A little bit. I want to hit him with a cricket bat. Why not a baseball bat? Candace asked with a slight smile. Because I don't want to go to jail for assault and I think a cricket bat would probably cause less injury. I also love the sight of that flat bat smacking his ass. I want his body to hurt so much that it hurts to put on or take off his clothes. This is impractical for two reasons. Why? We live on an island where no one plays cricket. So where do you find a cricket bat? Don was right. The second reason... Violence never solves anything. I disagree. This stopped fascism in Europe. You can't compare Hunter to a Nazi. Well, you're right here. There is no comparison. A Nazi never had sex with my wife. I know that the worst thing for you is lies and deception. This breach of trust will be difficult to correct. I was silent for several seconds. Everyone was looking at me, waiting to see how I would react to her overture. Actually, this is not the worst thing. The worst part is that you had sex with someone other than me. Linda tried to save what she saw as a chance for me to accept her sincere and remorseful confession. 
I only had sex with him seven times. I nodded. What a relief. Thank God only seven times, and not some unforgivable number. Since you all seem to be experts on this subject, what exactly would that number be? I looked at everyone in the room. Nobody answered this question. I didn't expect anyone to answer since the question was rhetorical. Don tried to avoid answering. Once, twice, a hundred times. This is not the most important thing. What matters is that Linda wants to restore your marriage and is incredibly remorseful. Candace supported him before a second had even passed. Can you be sure that the problem you are facing is not your ego? I didn't even have to think about how to answer. I can answer this unequivocally, Candace. Of course it's my ego. I just can't believe you all here are trying to minimize this. Don said, Listen to me, brother. Your ego is something you can control. Nobody is trying to minimize it. You can strengthen yourself by defeating your ego. Why let this stand in the way of true love? Look at it this way. Forgiveness is a gift you give not only to another person, but also to yourself. I felt like I was in the Twilight Zone or Los Angeles. So, if I had an affair with a woman seven times in three months, would you forgive me? Oh yes, yes and yes again. I wouldn't like it. This is the worst thing I can imagine, but I would take you back. I'll prove it to you. Have an affair, get even with me. I deserve it. I want you to have an affair. Please do this if it will help us get back together. This can happen to anyone. I admit that she said the right words. I asked a question. Linda, why did you do this? This has nothing to do with you, Ryan. When Candace and I were dating, she always had an attractive friend, and I always had a less attractive one. I've never gotten a handsome one. This was the only time the handsome man became interested in me. This didn't improve my mood. I know I'm not handsome. What surprised me was that Candace was angrier than I was. Are you really blaming me for everything, bitch? I was afraid that Candace would scratch her face, but Don held his wife back. Linda stood up from her chair and said, I was just jealous. Oh, please don't think I blame you. You are my sister. It was my insecurity. I don't want to lose our friendship. Candace stopped struggling from Don's embrace and said, We have always been and always will be sisters. I'm really sorry you didn't get any handsome ones. You deserve it. Although none of the handsome men can compare with my Don, I wish you had learned sooner that looks aren't everything. I felt like the conversation had somehow escaped me, and at that moment I was most worried about myself. I tried to return everything to normal. Candace, I know you love your best friend and you say I'm a good friend too. If I cheated on Linda, would you be as forgiving? Would you persuade her to make peace with me? Candace somehow moved away from the emotional moment and said, Look, she was able to share her life. What she did has nothing to do with you. She lived two different lives. I said, That sounds like complete nonsense. I know this is hard for men to understand, Candace said, but all women are capable of this to one degree or another. This was also unexpected. I turned. Don, if Candace cheated on you for three months, would you forgive her? Don looked at me, offended. This is a ridiculous question. Candace is not some dirty slut who would betray her husband, change, and would risk my marriage. Linda began to cry and howl. Don hit an obstacle and backed out. What I meant was that we can all give in to temptation, even Candace. She will always overcome temptation, but if she doesn't, I will forgive her. Even if she gives in to temptation seven times? Once, twice, a hundred times. Not in this case. It is important to deal with your male ego. So, my love for Candace is stronger. This seemed like complete crap to me. So I asked his wife, Candace, if you cheated on Don, who I know you love, would you expect him to forgive you? I can't believe you're even asking me. I'm not some fallen woman. Linda screamed and collapsed into the fetal position. Candace ran up and hugged her. No, not you, Linda. You are not a fallen woman just because you had sex with another man other than your husband. Linda howled even louder. Sex with someone else does not make you a fallen woman. You do not fallen woman. You didn't do this for the money. You did this because you have problems with a low self-esteem. Linda began to shake and hit herself in the face. I saw Don wondering whether to call an ambulance. 
Don and Candace held Linda's hands. I tried to call reason into the room again after Linda stopped herself from attacking herself. I looked at Candace. So let's see if I got this right. Linda wants me to have an affair. Don says he'll forgive you for having an affair. You're saying it's normal for someone to want sex with an attractive person. Did I understand correctly? Yes, Don answered. We all tell you this. Candace, you also told me that I should love Linda as much as you do because I was the one who married her. Yes, Ryan, you married her, for better or for worse. Don and I are more concerned about her well-being than you are. She's clearly hot. Well, I said, you've all given me a lot to think about. I thought now was the right time to apologize and get it over with. I liked Don, I liked Candace, and I fucking loved Linda. Cutting them all out of my life would be painful. However, this evening turned into a circus, and not in a good way. I left that evening feeling like I had ruined their close relationship, but neither of them really cared about me. I returned home and stared at the ceiling for hours, thinking. Around 3 a.m., I had an epiphany. I actually slept for two hours after replaying it in my head several times. I woke up to the doorbell ringing after I had my first cup of coffee. Yes, I wake up after the first cup of coffee. I don't remember how I somehow sent the children to school. I wasn't sure I fed them. It was Candace. I invited her in, but I was wary. The previous night had been a shit show. I took a second cup of coffee and poured it for her. Sorry about the shit show yesterday, Candace said. I nearly spat out my coffee when she repeated my thoughts. After a few seconds, I said, I decided that you were right. You show more concern for her well-being than I do. So I have a solution. I'm glad you came to your senses. I paused for dramatic effect. You and I will have an affair. Seven meetings. After this, Linda will be completely forgiven. What? Seriously, what? Linda said I could have an affair if it would help. So I take her word for it. Don said he'll forgive you if you cheat on him, so I'll take his word for it. You said you want me to forgive Linda, so I'll take your word for it. I should talk to Don about this before I even think about it. This will ruin the situation. Linda hid it from me, lied and kept me in the dark. Everything should be the same. Don has already said that he will forgive you, so there is no need to consult him. Linda never told me I was the one who caught her. Tell him when it's over, if necessary. Damn it, I want you to tell him after this is all over, but not before. Still, it won't be as mean as Linda acted. I'll definitely tell Linda, too. How the hell am I supposed to meet Don every day and keep it a secret? You have to share your life. I heard from you that all women can do this better than men. I don't think I can do this. There's too much to think about. Why don't you just find someone else? Well, I'm pretty sure I won't find the right beauty that really attracts me. I'll probably have to hire an escort. I do not like it. You have a personal interest and an amazing body, so you are my option. She replied, I have to think. Of course, that meant no. I wasn't surprised that Candace didn't really mean what she said that night. She just didn't try all this nonsense on herself. I was making plans for a divorce. Unexpectedly, two days later, Candace changed her mind. I decided to accept your demand. I wish I could say it was because she was crazy about me. But alas, the real reason was mundane and perhaps predictable. She showed up at my house in a frenzy without even knocking, just opening the door and bursting inside. I can't stand it anymore. She's driving Don and me crazy. She's ruining my marriage. I could have said something sarcastic at that moment, but when things are going well, it's better to mind your own business, which was a shame because I actually had something to say. Candace agreed to all my conditions. Her only demand was that I would actually forgive Linda completely if Candace followed through. Honestly, I didn't expect her to ever agree with everything I said, so I only hesitated for a moment. After a short pause came, Absolutely. I'm only doing this because she's my best friend. You, I don't like you too much right now. However, she agreed, and that was really important. We started working out the details. It will look suspicious if you immediately forgive Linda. How do we sell this to Linda and Don that you're taking Linda back? I had an answer to this question. 
All I needed was to offer Linda a lifeline. I called Linda during my lunch break that day. Linda, I need you to report your relationship with Hunter to HR. What should I tell you? I can't say it was sexual harassment. I won't lie. I'm not asking you to do this, my dear. I'm not asking you to do anything unethical that will affect your conscience. However, after reading your employee handbook, I discovered that there is no communication policy between a supervisor and a subordinate. You know, one of the measures aimed at preventing the possibility of sexual harassment. You really work in a good company. So just report the relationship. She did it. It turned out that Hunter was married to a very rich woman with a prenuptial agreement. It's a gift when the enemy puts his own head in the noose, and all you have to do is knock the chair out from under your feet. Let's just say Hunter got into trouble and left Hawaii, never to be seen again. After Linda did this, I welcomed her home. I greeted her with kisses and we made passionate love the night she returned home. Linda and I were together again, although it was conditional. I haven't thrown away my reservations. Linda felt it. We made love and acted like a family. But she knew that I had not completely forgiven her. She knew there was still a wall. She was right. This wall won't come down until Candace makes up her mind. Candace didn't back down when I agreed on our first date. I decided it would be spectacular. I booked a room at the Four Seasons with a king bed. I placed rose petals on the slightly discarded bed. I lit the candles and made sure they wouldn't set off the smoke alarm because I turned it off. She will see a bottle of champagne and a vase of strawberries when she enters. This will be an illicit affair. I will play the role of lover until the end. I wanted her to be in on it, so it was only right that I was in on it too. It turned out to be easy for me. I was looking forward to it, and although part of me felt like Candace might give up at any moment, I wasn't going to be the one to kill her momentum. I was going to do my part and trust that she would do hers. If not, we'll just go back to where we started. Candace ruined my plans. She appeared wearing a long coat that was very inappropriate for the climate and carrying what might as well have been an overnight bag. Ryan, what kind of champagne with strawberries? This won't work. From what? I already have the most romantic, wonderful, best lover at home. So I don't want you to even dream of becoming a better lover. Sweep those fucking rose petals off the bed. I also don't eat strawberries and just give me a few minutes in the bathroom. Does this mean you are retreating? No. It just means that we will have sex, not make love. I'd rather not see a single pink petal on the bed when I come out of the bathroom. Walking in with her bag, she slammed the door. Old Faithful stood at attention even before she entered the room. While I was waiting for her to come out, the poor thing was fading by the minute, and I thought, what the hell is she doing there? The woman who came out of the bathroom was packed in a black bra that was a size too small and black panties that looked like they had been painted on. Her newly applied lipstick was a shade of red that I think is called Fuck Me. So if this works, I'm Candy. You don't make love to me. You don't call me Candace. I'm Candy. I'm not your lover. I'm your fallen woman. Every time we meet, I'm sweetie, and I'm here to have you. That's all my plans. I was completely attentive. Call me Candace once and it'll be over. From now until we're done with the hot and sweaty, I'm Candy. Are there any problems with this? For what? I grabbed her, and our tongues danced in the blink of an eye. This was not at all what I had imagined or planned. This was much better. Candace, or was it Candy, led me to the bed, pushed me back onto it, and simply pulled my pants down and worked on my manhood. These were the most juicy moments of my life. I thought I would die after this. Our pillow talk after that was a little unconventional. I was in a fog, and she spoke while I listened. At that moment, I was very receptive to everything she had to say. That's how it works. You don't have sex with Candace, you have candy. If you mess up just once, I won't be able to live with it. Don't say shit, just agree, and candy will drive you crazy. Agree? Looking back, I think it may have been a CIA technique, although it may have just been endorphins. I agreed. Fine. Now candy wants to get fucked, so do it, and you better not disappoint me.
we fucked each other, and it was phenomenal. The following meetings were a variation of the first. We had sex, she turned me on again, and then we had sex again. She liked to say obscenities. Fuck me, fuck me hard, you son of a bitch. When she said that, I couldn't tell whether she hated me or, on the contrary, she liked it. I assumed it was a little bit of both because it intensified with each subsequent meeting. Organizing these meetings became increasingly difficult. Sneaking turned out to be much more difficult than I had imagined. Much of this difficulty stemmed from Linda calling me every chance she got to let me know where she was and that she wasn't cheating on me. This made it much more difficult for me to cheat on her. I also imagined that Candace had a hard time hiding it from Don, but we never talked about it. When we got together, it was just a fucking marathon. While my affair with Candy continued, I was surprised to lose almost all hostility toward Linda. Each infrequent rendezvous of hot sex with Linda's best friend made me appreciate lovemaking with my wife even more. After each illicit sex I had with Candy, I felt more and more comfortable with Linda. We were returning to where we were before. I appreciated the insatiable sex with Candy, but it also made me appreciate the tender connection with Linda. I wondered if she felt the same way, juggling her sex with Hunter and still loving me. The only awkward moments at first were when the four of us were together. Don or Linda would make completely innocent remarks, but at the same time make my brain say, don't look at Candace, don't look at Candace, don't fucking look at Candace. For example, Don once said, I admire you, Ryan. I know it was hard for you. You have chosen a difficult path. You could have hired an attractive prostitute as revenge, but you didn't. You invited Linda to make amends, and she did. Well done, brother. While I was thinking, why does Don think I don't deserve anything more than a prostitute? Reason intervened, and then, don't you dare meet Candace's eyes. So I said, thank you, brother. Candace seemed completely calm. I have to admit, there was something about women being better at compartmentalizing their lives. It was not easy for me in conversations with sexual overtones. While our kids were playing and the adults were drinking wine, Linda looked at Don and Candace and said, You helped Ryan and I get back together. Then she kissed me. After we broke the kiss, all I thought was, Don't look at Candace. Don't look at Candace. This was relatively easy since Candace also avoided making eye contact with me in these situations. Candace and Candy seemed like completely different people. Candy sent me messages as we got closer to the meeting. And yes, it was Candy, not Candace. I became concerned that I might be contributing to the creation of multiple personality disorder, but I pushed the thought aside because I needed to save my marriage. Nothing worthwhile comes without costs. Candy sent me photos of herself in seductive outfits. Yes, I had already seen her naked, but these photos turned me on. I had, sweetie, to prove my point to her, Don, and Linda. I also had her because she was hot. I had no idea if my relationship with them would ultimately survive, but I hoped it would. I'm an idealistic ass. Candy was more than true to her word. She was a monster. I had her in positions that avoided the intimacy of hearts and were only sex. Besides, dirty sex. The exception was last night. We had more time than usual since we didn't have to worry about getting caught. After that night, Candace made it clear that she was going to tell Don everything. We left with one last hooray. I made it to three finishes, and I have no idea how many she had. We were both so loud and vocal that I'm surprised the other couples at this cheap motel didn't report us to management because we were disturbing them. We definitely came out with a bang and more than a few whimpers. After our last wild sex session, I showered first and managed to mostly regain my balance. Candy went, and when the bathroom door opened again, Candy was gone forever. Candace emerged from the bathroom in her usual modest outfit, her behavior spoke for itself. We're done. It was good. Indulging in sweet treats from time to time is fun, but a constant diet of sweets will kill you. Candace left before me. There was no goodbye kiss, just a discussion of what we would do next. 
she was going to tell Don everything in the evening. And after that, we would tell Linda everything. After all, it was a family affair. Candace will tell Don, and then we can all meet at my house. I told Linda that Don and Candace would come over after the kids were in bed. It was time to put everything on the table. Something happened to Don, so he was going to arrive late. So it was just me, Candace, and Linda. I went first. Linda, I am completely ready to forgive you. In fact, I have already forgiven. But before you accept that, I think Candace should speak up first. Linda was excited to hear my words, then looked questioningly at Candace. I had sex with Ryan. Linda immediately hugged Candace. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh God, you really are my sister. Candace hugged her back and said, It was the only way. I love you. It was you, Linda said passionately. Now I don't have to worry about whether Ryan got sick or someone got pregnant. Thank you. Things didn't go as I expected. I thought shuffling was complete crap. I didn't believe anyone was sincere in what they were saying. It turns out I was wrong, at least with regard to women. When I'm wrong, I admit it, no matter how painful it is. I joined them in a group hug. I looked at Linda and said, Everything is truly forgiven. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. She jumped on me and kissed me. Thank you, my love. You will never regret this. Well, I think we've all learned some valuable lessons here. In the end, I had to calm her down. I looked at Candace and said, You showed me a lot and I want to apologize to you. I embarrassed you and you showed me the true meaning of love. I was wrong to ask you this. You made me a better person by showing me what true love is. Candace hugged me tightly and pecked me on the lips. Not at all like lately. I did this for both of you. You two belong together. The doorbell rang. I assumed it was dawn. Now open. As I approached the door, I realized that I had a lot to say. I learned a lot about myself and the people who were close to me. Tears came to my eyes when I realized that the people around me were much more selfless than I was. I tried to show how hypocritical those around me are, and I discovered that this is not the case. In fact, it was all about my male ego. I had to apologize to everyone, but especially to Don. Don, the women there are crying with all their might. To tell the truth, I feel like crying myself. I've learned quite a few things about myself, and not all of them are good. I also learned something about myself. I think we're all probably onto something with this whole male ego thing. I dismissed the idea too lightly. Don had a hoarse tone and a strange expression on his face. It took me a while to understand this, as it was a feeling I had never seen in Don. And then it hit me. Barely contained rage. Ah, that's it. At that moment, I had two questions. Firstly, where did he find the cricket bat so quickly? Second, would I have a half-second head start to get to the back door before an angry mastodon with a bad knee caught up with me? I decided that the answer to the first question could wait, and I rushed through the house to the back door. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Third story. Maybe you would call me Everly Chilton, naive or too trusting. I was once like that, but not anymore. My husband Harris and I met after college while working in neighboring buildings. We seemed to take an almost instant liking to each other. He is very good looking and charming. After five or six dates, we started having sex. Even though we got along well and had a good rhythm in bed, I was surprised when he asked me to marry him. The reason I was surprised was because I had seen pictures of all his old girlfriends he didn't hide them from me, and I didn't hide my past from him either. And they were all well-endowed. I'm proud of my breasts, but I don't have nice soft curves. As a result of weekly intense exercise, I have an athletic body, but with a huge muscular bubble butt. Anyway, Harris and I got married, and my best friend Ashley Morton was my maid of honor. Ashley's husband Bill, owner of an event planning company, was kind enough to plan our wedding only at cost. Harris seemed to really like Bill, and not just because he made our wedding inexpensive, and Ashley. We became and remained great friends with Ashley and Bill, and together we're part of a friendship group of six couples. 
Harris and I agreed on many important things, not the least of which was that we would have at least two children, but only after six years of marriage. So I regularly took a birth control shot every three months, which is important because our sex life never really stopped, a nice three or more times a week. Ashley is a little older than me, so while Harris and I had been married for about three years, and she and Bill had been married for about six, she went off birth control. At that time, Harris and I shared almost everything, except toothbrushes, and only our cars were different. I have a Prius, and he has a Dodge Challenger. He thought my car was too prim. I thought his car was too macho. He hates prim. I hate macho. Plus, while Harris is tidy in our house, his car, at least to me, looks like a pile of garbage, with papers, plastic cups, and sports equipment everywhere. So when we go somewhere together, I usually, I have to throw the trash from the front seat to the back seat before I can sit down. On that fateful Saturday in May, we were going to a local minor league baseball game and were supposed to meet Bill and Ashley there. For some reason, I was ready before he was, which only happens 10% of the time, so I did a more thorough job than usual, cleaning his front seat too before sitting down, even spraying it with cleaner and wiping it down. Just before I finished wiping the seat, I noticed a small box under the seat. The label said, Trojan Treat Pack. I took out the box. On the front, there were four types of condoms listed. I didn't know there were so many. And there were 12 in total. I opened the box and counted three remaining. I carefully placed the box in my purse and got into the car just before Harris arrived. For the rest of my story to make sense, you need to know that my two passions, besides exercise, are theater and cooking. I had been an amateur actor most of my life and had been involved in a community theater production just 10 months before this big day. Also, I love experimenting with all kinds of spices and unusual dishes, which in 90% of cases are well received by everyone who uses them. Having done some of my best acting work, I was warm and playful in my conversations with Harris on the way to the game while being angry inside and already working on a plan for what I would do about it. Despite the negative impact my discovery had on my mood, on the surface, I had a good time. I was tempted to tell Ashley about my dilemma, but then I realized that I had to go it alone and gather a lot more information before I made a decision on all aspects of my investigation and probably some form of revenge. One of the home team's players wore number seven, just like Hall of Famer Mickey Mantle. I secretly looked for it in the program. His name was Derek Voorhees. He was 23 years old, 6 foot 3, 220 pounds, attending North Carolina at Chapel Hill, his first year on our AAA minor league team, and he led the league in home runs. Using a technique I had long learned, I became fixated on Derek as my anger began to boil over. Much later, after dinner with Bill, Ashley, and another couple, when we went to bed, I was not in the mood to have sex with Harris. However, during sex, I imagined myself fucking someone else. I had an incredible orgasm when I mentally had sex with the baseball player Derek Voorhees. Harris must have really enjoyed our fucking because then, as our sweaty bodies cooled and puffed, he whispered, You really outdid yourself, Everly. Fun, yes, was the most I could say in response without anger breaking through my facade. Luckily, it was enough for him to start snoring after a quick kiss and a brief hug. Surprisingly, I fell asleep soon after, convincing myself that I needed a good night's sleep to think about my next move. I knew I had to do it quickly to get the box of condoms back to Harris's car. As I was taking out the ingredients to make the pancakes, my eyes fell on one of my homemade spices, a habanero-based blend that I use for Mexican dishes. I had an idea that made me whistle while I was making pancakes. Harris ate six pancakes. After breakfast, while Harris was washing our cars in front of the house, I took out a pin and an eyedropper. I mixed the habanero mixture with a little alcohol to thin it out, pricked each of the three packages of condoms in the box with a pin, and used a dropper to carefully inject the liquid into the condoms. I knew the dosage was unlikely to give me all the information I needed to catch Harris, but it was good revenge before I went out and hired a private investigator. I returned the Trojan box to exactly where it had been under the passenger seat in Harris's Challenger 
and then tried to put it out of my mind. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I work from home. I had sex with Harris on Monday and Tuesday. And again, I had to think about the hot baseball player in order to legitimately orgasm. Already on Thursday, around one o'clock in the afternoon, Ashley called me. Everly, something is seriously wrong. My pussy is burning so bad I'm afraid I'll crash the car if I drive it and Bill is at a meeting in the next town over. Could you please take me to a local clinic? The sounds she made as she said those words were scary, so I immediately took the keys to my Prius and drove to her house just a mile away. She stumbled along, clutching an ice pack to her groin. She had no explanation for the heat in her groin. Luckily, the local clinic was also nearby, and there was a parking space right in front of it. I helped her in and even checked her in using her insurance card and ID from her purse. After that, I asked the nurse if I could come in. Apparently, the nurse thought I was her sister, since our facial features, height, and hair are very similar, and muttered what I interpreted as... Yes. I walked up to the door to the room, and the soundproofing wasn't that good. I heard Ashley say, It started during midday sex. I didn't go in, but went out into the lobby. Since Bill was out of town at lunchtime and Harris had condoms with habanero sauce, it didn't take a genius to figure out what happened. As hard as it was to believe, I couldn't think of any other rational explanation. Luckily, I had 20 minutes before Ashley came out, still bow-legged, but with a much less contorted and sweaty face. So I regained my composure and relied on my acting skills. On the way home, I briefly and delicately questioned Ashley. Did they tell you what it was? They think it was an allergic reaction to a new skin cream I used on my thighs and crotch. It was a lie that Ashley stammered out. How soon will you feel better? I asked with an internal laugh. Probably in two or three days. You won't have to make children for a while. I chuckled. Ashley didn't grin back. If there was any doubt, and there wasn't, it disappeared when I looked at Harris's red-hot crutch while he was in the shower. He asked out of sex when I faked it that night. Sorry, Everly, but for some reason I'm not feeling well tonight. It's okay, honey, get better. I answered with obvious concern, laughing to myself. After Harris fell asleep, I went to the 24-hour pharmacy, bought two condoms exactly like the ones he left in his box, and replaced them with new ones. I put the old condoms in a kitchen garbage bag and threw the bag in the trash outside. The next step was to catch them red-handed. I met with a private investigator, but when I found out how much it cost, I wasn't sure I could hide that amount from Harris. However, what I could do is talk to Bill, but I had to do it right. The following Monday, I had to fake an orgasm for the second time in my life with Harris because I couldn't imagine the guy playing baseball. I invited Bill to lunch on Tuesday. He was a little surprised, but happily agreed to meet. He was confused when I told him it was about a surprise for Ashley, so he wouldn't tell her. I met Bill in a secluded place. He laughed and commented on its lack of charm. This is a business meeting, Bill, I answered seriously. Oh shit, what's happened? Before I begin, I need to get a guarantee from you in writing, and I handed him a simple one-page document. This stipulated that in exchange for me providing him with valuable confidential information, he would keep this. Information secret for 45 days unless I gave him permission to disclose it earlier. Damages of a $25,000 were provided in case of violation. Bill raised his eyebrows, looked deep into my eyes, and apparently concluded that the information was serious and we both signed and dated the document. I told Bill what I had learned and that I needed his help in hiring a detective. He needed to pay using his business account, and when it was finished, I would give him half back. Bill, frustrated, simply picked at his food. I had more time to adjust, and I ate everything on my plate. Although the place was not cozy, it was good food. After lunch, Bill and I went straight to the detective's office and signed the contract. We gave him written permission to watch our homes, in seed and out, and take photographs of Ashley and Harris. Bill and I worked out fake trips out of town over the next week, me on Tuesday and Wednesday until Thursday morning, Bill on Wednesday and Thursday, so that there would be no suspicion that we were out of town at the same time. 
During my fictitious absence, I worked in Bill's office and he worked in mine. We met with the detective on Saturday after our fake trips. Unfortunately, the news was, as we expected, Ashley and Harris had sex three times between Wednesday evening and Thursday morning in the guest room of Bill's home, and it was recorded in bright color or infrared with clear audio. The only good thing was that they didn't scold me or Bill. The question was what to do about it. After talking with the private detective, Bill and I went to the park to discuss something. We foresaw this, so we thought about it for a while. I spoke. Bill, no matter what happens next, my friendship with Ashley is over and my marriage to Harris is over. I won't interfere with what you decide to do, but I also want to get a little revving on both of them. More than revving ye with a habanero? He grinned, although the situation was not funny at all. Of course more. I snorted. I think I want to try to save my marriage, Bill said with the air of a hanged dog. It will depend on how Ashley reacts when I tell her. Okay, but remember our contract. I need a few more days to decide what to do, so don't pin this on Ashley until I give the go-ahead. I promise it will take much less time than 45 days. Bill shook his head dejectedly. We briefly hugged and he sadly walked away. That weekend, I had to fake another orgasm with Harris. Monday morning, as I was looking through the local morning paper, I looked at the front page. On the front page of the sports section was a photo of Derek Voorhees elevating hat to the hometown baseball crowd. The caption mentioned that he set a team record by hitting three homers in one game. I have an idea. Before I reveal my idea, I need to communicate two things for it to make sense. One flattering but probably proven truth and one unflattering but definitely true, provable the truth. Jacques Wo one, my hard body is considered hot and my face is considered cute. Der two, when I'm wronged, I'm angry, nasty, overly vindictive, as half a dozen people from my past will testify with their hand on the Bible. That Monday morning, I found Bill between meetings. Bill, you can run into Ashley whenever it's convenient for you. However, there are two conditions on which I insist that you give her the opportunity to remain in the marriage. I need to know one, and I need her temporary consent to the other. Okay, Bill answered cautiously. I want you to make her admit how many times, over what period of time, she and Harris had sex, and who initiated it. And I need you to make her promise not to tell Harris what we know until I'm ready. You can do it? I concluded holding both his hands and looking into his eyes. After a long pause, he replied, Fine. I'll talk to her on Wednesday and then call you on your cell phone. Bill called me Wednesday night and said that Ashley tearfully admitted that she had been having an affair with Harris for over a year, usually once a week, and that it started with him coming up to her and saying, I love your tits. My head almost exploded. Now I was ready for scorched earth revenge. I believed that Harris would want to save the marriage and that I could get him to do something that would go beyond all possible boundaries. Of course, I had no intention of saving the marriage, but he didn't know that. If he is not interested in saving the marriage, then I will develop another win-win plan. I didn't wait. I threw the case in his face, including a couple of incriminating photos from sessions recorded by our private investigator. The following Wednesday night, screaming like a banshee. I called him all sorts of names, destroyed two pieces of memorabilia from his youth, and threw his pillow and related items out of our bedroom and into the guest room. I then closed and locked our bedroom door and installed a newly purchased door strip between the doorknob and the floor. I ignored the begs and pleads at the door and actually slept for a while, thinking about how amazing my revenge would be. Harris begged and crawled for the next three days. Finally, I heard words that were music to my ears. Everly, we can get through this. I love you very much, and I want you and me to have children. Please don't file for divorce. I will do anything to stay married. Anything. Bullshit, I growled. You say so, but you won't do it. I guarantee that you are too damn weak and care too little about me to complete the one simple task that I need to give to our marriage. More one chance. After that, I turned to leave. He gently grabbed my hand. Please, Everly, darling, I mean it, he begged, and there seemed to be real tears in his eyes. 
I stopped and stared at him. He knelt down. Okay, I giggled. Arrange me a night with Derek. Voorhees at a local luxury hotel. Then I turned and walked towards the garage to get into my Prius. You can't be serious. You mean the baseball player? I could never do that. Even if I agreed to this, I have no way to do it. Here are some of his laments. I stopped at the garage door, turned to him, and, with venom dripping from my mouth, growled, I told you that you're not just a fucking cheater, but also a liar. You said whatever and lied. Fuck you. Tell me where you want your divorce papers filed. Then I ran out to the sound of his faint cry. Wait. During this time, Ashley tried to contact me. After avoiding her for a week, I accepted her call. After she admitted how sorry she was, to which I replied that she was only sorry Thatcher caught, she asked how I found out everything. We were so careful, and whether you believe it or not, we never showed you disrespect, she whined. I didn't respond to her irrational whining, but I saw no reason not to partially tell her. I get it because you're really stupid, I giggled. Did I screw up? She asked with true shock. Hell yes. You called me to take you to the clinic with a burning crotch. I thought the skincare allergy story was fake, and I was sure of it when I was about to enter the room at the clinic and overheard you tell the doctor that you had just had sex. Ashley gasps loudly. Bill wasn't there, and I realized that you were having an affair, and you were disgusting to me. Imagine my surprise when that same night I saw Harris with a red-hot crotch. After that, I hired a private investigator and the rest is history. You are so stupid that you had the nerve to ask me to take you to the clinic right after you had sex with my husband. Don't contact me anymore. You're dead to me, I shouted before ending the conversation. Our house was freezing as we coexisted for the next few days. I refused to have lunch with Harris. I listened indifferently to his pleas for some alternatives to stay together. When Monday evening came the next week, I showed him, but more did not officially file, divorce papers along with a draft lawsuit against Ashley for alienation of affection and asked where to serve him. He really broke down and cried. I gave him no mercy. Finally, he regained his composure and muttered, If I agree to your proposal, it will be for just one night with Voorhees, and you won't file for divorce. Of course, I lied. He lied to me for over a year, so I had no reason to tell him the truth. For the next ten days I asked him once a day, Have you already agreed? I swear I'm working on it, but it's difficult, was his typical response. Then one day he said, You know what could help if I showed him a photo of you naked? Okay, I grinned. But not a digital photograph, but a print in a closed transparent case, which will be returned to me as soon as he looks. I prepared myself and found a clear case that will simply provide a white color if I try to photograph it. I asked Bill, not Harris, to take two nude photos of me, front and back. I was pleased to see how Bill's eyes widened and sweat formed on his forehead as he took photographs, and how he could not speak a word as he looked at me as I slowly got dressed. I don't know how Harris did it. Derek must like fit women, but three days after I gave Harris the photos, sweating profusely and in a meek voice, he muttered, I got Derek to agree. He's free next Monday night. I'll rent a room at the Four Seasons. Are you really going to do this? What? I growled. You think you can have sex with Ashley for a whole year and I won't go through with it? I'm looking forward to the best sex of my life, and don't ask me again if I'm going to go through with it. Just give me the key to the room and tell me when to meet him, after you sign this application, I said, throwing the one-page contract my lawyer had drawn up on the kitchen table. The contract stated that what I did as agreed would have no effect if either of us ever filed for divorce. Although I didn't really have much faith in Harris to set up my date, I liked being prepared. So I searched the internet and found many articles about Derek during his time as a star on the North Carolina baseball team, including two that mentioned his college girlfriend. She had a distinctive name, and I was able to track her down and talk to her on the phone. The only reason they broke up with her was because she didn't want the life of a baseball wife, and it was clear that he wanted to play for at least another 15 years. Derek's girlfriend from college told me two interesting things about him. One, even though he is a super stud, he is modest and insecure about his sexual prowess. 
two, he has a phobia about contracting STDs, and so they both get tested every few months. Without STD test results, he always uses condoms, which I don't like. Surprisingly, on Monday morning, Harris delivered me a key card for room 1725 at the Four Seasons Hotel. Derek wants to meet you at 5 y p.m. for dinner, he squeaked in a voice as weak as a mouse's. Give me $140 for dinner, I replied. After Harris left, I took the rest of the day off and got a massage, crotch trim, pedicure, manicure, and facial. After the spa, I went straight to the Four Seasons. Up close, Derek turned out to be even more handsome and muscular than I thought. As expected, he was no fool. Graduated from New York's Chapel Hill. What surprised me was that he was extremely charming and funny. Derek tried to ask about my agreement with Harris, but I interrupted him. Holding his hand and looking into his sexy azure eyes, I said, We won't talk about this, Derek. You can look at it as if someone gave you an expensive call girl for the night, with whom you can do whatever you want but without pain, and you don't even have to care whether she has an orgasm or not. I said this to ease any performance pressure he might have, as his ex-girlfriend warned me. Then I continued, You can do it? A smile wider than the Mississippi River appeared on his face. I can do it, he grinned. Also, I want you to know that condoms are not necessary. Here's my doctor's receipt from last month saying I got my three-month birth control shot, and the lab report just two days ago saying I'm STD-free. He smiled even wider, but said nothing. Derek and I had a very pleasant conversation over dinner. I'm only three years older than him, so we didn't belong to different generations and we had a lot to talk about. It felt like it was just a first date between people who wanted to be with each other. The only difference was my initiative. After a light dinner, we walked holding hands through the beautiful grounds of the hotel and the adjacent park where children played baseball and young people played volleyball. After a leisurely 45 minute, we walked straight back to the front door of the hotel. It's time to get payback from your dear call girl, I whispered in his ear, and then quickly kissed him on the lips. Obviously, this was said correctly. His smile grew even wider. When we got up to room 1725, I playfully pushed Derek onto the main sofa, knelt down, and took off his shoes and socks, lightly rubbing his bare skin with my fingers. Then I stood up, kicked off my high heels, grabbed his hands, and pulled him to his feet. I slowly and erotically unbuttoned his shirt, making complimentary or carnal noises as I did so, tossing the shirt aside and holding out my hands, inviting him to unbutton the buttons of my blouse. This was followed by his tank top and my bra, then his pants and my skirt. He quickly picked me up, carried me to the double four-poster bed, and threw me onto the luxurious coverlet. Then he attacked me like a man possessed. I thought we would take care of him first. Obviously, he had other ideas. It was absolutely adorable. I temporarily lost consciousness. I pressed myself against his chest and planted dozens of quick kisses on his lips as he chuckled with a series of interjections such as, I've never I'll recover, and what the hell did you do to me? Between kisses, I muttered, My whole body is tingling and I really passed out from the sensory overload. After some bliss, Derek said, We're both too sweaty. Let's take the covers off the bed, take a shower, and then get under the covers. Sounds good to me, I grinned. The shower stall was richly decorated with multiple shower heads at different heights. We heated the water and then soaped each other up. Derek lifted me up like I weighed nothing and pressed my back against the wall of the shower stall. I've never had a partner strong enough to have sex with me like this before. It was divine. I temporarily blacked out again. Luckily, Derek didn't. Otherwise, we would both have fallen onto the tile floor. I came to my senses a little. He drilled me with a fluffy towel, picked me up again and carried me to the four-poster bed, and then pressed me under the covers, completely enveloping me in his arms. I almost never sleep after 6.30 a.m. When my eyes finally opened the next morning, the room was bright and the clock next to me showed 8.37. I slipped out of bed, did my chores, took a quick shower, and returned to bed. Derek sat, on the bed with a grin. 
When he got up to go to the bathroom, I pressed my naked body against him. I'm not done with you yet, I growled, gently squeezing him in my arms. Woe is me, he sighed. I briefly lost consciousness for the third time this morning. I lay on top of Derek, stroking his face and shoulders, while he caressed the sides of my breasts as we muttered sweet nothings and fell asleep again. Sometime later I woke up with a start, looked at the clock, which showed 10.32, and then poked Derek in the ribs. Wake up, Rip Van Winkle, I giggled. Checkout time is 11 a.m., so get your ass out of bed. We both climbed out of bed and used the toothbrushes and mouthwash provided by the hotel. How about a quick shower? Derek chuckled. Hell no, I don't I'll recover from communicating with you for another week. I quickly kissed him on the lips. Since we didn't have any luggage to pack, we went down to the ticket counter at 11.01 and then went to the restaurant to have breakfast. We carried on a completely cheerful conversation, occasionally holding hands or touching each other's legs. When we both realized it was getting close to 1 p.m., he insisted on paying. Since you embarrassed me by paying for dinner, we got up to leave. Leaving the hotel, we hugged. I looked into his eyes and said, Last night was supposed to be just for you, but it ended up being more for me. I'm sorry. Derek laughed heartily. This must be some alternate universe where a hot woman gives me the sex of my life and then apologizes. The vision of your body and face is burned into my ID to remain forever. He chuckled. We kissed each other quickly and then he said, So now you are returning to your husband as a faithful wife? That's what I told him. I smiled. I answered his question vaguely for two reasons. First of all, I didn't want to lie to him and tell him I was going back to Harris because I was divorcing his ass. The second reason was that my time with Derek was so amazing for both of us that I was afraid that he would want to sleep again. I would probably be too weak to resist, but I didn't want to cheat on Harris. Until the divorce was final, I would not have sex with anyone else, except this time with Harris's consent, because I did not want to stoop to Harris's level. We gave each other another passionate kiss. I wasn't in love with Derek, although it probably wouldn't have taken much to fall in love. I was very pleased to see how Harris was humiliated by my night with Derek. I shyly did not go into details, but smiled slyly. Fantastic revenge has been accomplished. Over the next two weeks, I fucked Harris several times out of mercy until completed negotiations for a new job in Washington, far from my current location. I also arranged for storage space and a moving company there and rented an apartment in Northern Virginia for a few months. Harris was surprised and truly angry when I served him with divorce papers 15 days after my night with Derek and told him that all communications would be through my lawyer and that I was leaving town. This time, instead of begging, he ranted, calling me a liar and a Jezebel. It had no effect on me and I left for D.C. an hour after it was served. He should have been glad that I filed on the grounds of irreconcilable differences rather than adultery and only asked for a 50-50 split of assets. I had already withdrawn my 50% of liquid assets. The ink had dried on my copy of the divorce decree just a couple of months ago when I was cleaning out my rental apartment in Northern Virginia on a Saturday. My new job was really working out and I was planning on moving to a nicer place somewhere within the next month. In old shorts, a worn t-shirt and dirty slippers, with her hair down and no makeup, I was doing a belated cleaning of my apartment when the doorbell rang. Since I lived in a safe area, I opened the door without first looking through the peephole. If I had looked through the peephole, I might not have opened it, given how ugly I looked at that moment. Derek! I almost squealed when I saw who rang my doorbell. Hey, sexy Everly, he grinned. You look great. The poor boy must have lost his sight. I wondered if that meant he couldn't play baseball anymore. What are you doing here? I hesitated. Let me in and I'll tell you, he grinned. I moved away so as not to block the entrance. He came in and hugged me tightly, and then we both sat on the sofa in the living room. The answer to the question has many parts. He began with a grin that seemed to widen. The first part is that I was promoted to the major leagues and traded to the Washington Nationals after signing a five-year contract. I have a new luxury condo, 
less than a mile from here. The second reason is that I finally found you. I asked my agent to look through the court records and found that you filed for divorce. So I asked him to start looking. Luckily, your name is unique enough. I never knew Everly before, even if married and maiden names aren't that unusual. So I found you about a week before I signed my contract. I just got back from spring training and tomorrow is home opener day. I have an invitation that I hope you will take advantage of. Why, why did you track me? I muttered. Derek laughed. If you have to ask, you must be the best actress in the world because I thought you liked it the first time we met as much as I did. Simply put, I want a relationship with you. I paused for a moment and then said, Relationships? Not one night stands? Yes, relationships. I was attracted to your personality as much as your looks, and considering you gave me the best sex of my life, the last thing I want is another one night stand. It would ruin me for all other women in the future and would probably ruin my career as I would suffer too much for not being with you. I swallowed hard. Do you really think I look sexy the way I do today? Or was that just an offhand comment? Are you really worried about how you look today? He chuckled. Then, grinning, but at the same time seriously, he said, The answer to your question is yes. I think you look incredibly sexy just the way you are. I'm not entirely sure how what happened next actually happened. Afterwards, everything happened quickly. I met Derek's parents and sister on the opening day of his house, not surprising because my place was next to theirs. We seemed to get along great. I moved into Derek's new house with him a week after it opened. After the season ended, we got married. Unlike his college girlfriend, I didn't mind the life of a major leaguer's wife because when he came home from trips, the sex was amazing. He's now signed his second major contract with the Nationals, and I'm pregnant with our second child. Once a week, I draft and then delete before sending an email to Harris and Ashley, thanking them for deceiving them, and then laughing because their hot crotches are responsible for my red-hot love life. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.